This morning we're continuing in our study in the book of Daniel. I want to share with you this passage out of Daniel chapter 2. I think if we understand what is going on here, it has long-reaching and long-lasting impacts that affect us today. In fact, I'll share with some of, some of that with you as, as we look at it. Where do you look when you have a question? A lot of people will go and they'll open up their phone and they'll look on Google and they'll ask questions. Of course, AI is a real big thing these days and people are always trying to find ways to, to find answers. People are looking everywhere for answers except to God. And I think the first place we need to look is to God. We need to ask what the Lord is saying. God alone knows and reveals mysteries. God alone knows the future. God alone knows what's going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, weeks from now, months from now, years from now. God knows the content of our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows the dreams that we have. He oftentimes will put them there. He can give true interpretations so that we can understand what's going on. I see a lot of deception going on right now. A lot of people being misled. And I think the primary reason for deception it's because people aren't opening up their Bibles and reading it. And if we would simply open up the Bible and read it, I think we may gain some things from that. So would you open up to Daniel 2 with me? We're going to start in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. And again, this is a long passage, so just relax and sit back and, and read it with me. Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed your thoughts turn to what take, might, would take place in the future. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breasts and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron, partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like the chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found." But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we shall tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom God, the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or beasts of the field, or birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused, them, uh, caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. And after you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, and then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, as, as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So like iron that breaks into pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces." And in that you saw the feet partly, and the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, some of the kingdom will be strong and some of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with the common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left for another people, and it will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. 
Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel, and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of Babylon, while Daniel was at the king's court. Let me pray. Lord God, we come to you this morning, and Father, your word has been read, and Lord, I pray that you would give us insight through your spirit. Help us, Lord, to align with what your word says, Lord, and to understand it. Give us the wisdom we need, Lord, so that we can know what you're trying not only to tell Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, but Lord, your message for us today in your word. Bless your people as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are many people who look all over the place, and we might think, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar, when he had this dream, the first thing that he did was call all of his soothsayers, all of his astrologers, all of his wizards, all of his wise men, all of the Chaldeans, all the people that he thought in his king's court could give him wisdom. And we might think, who is actually going to talk to a wizard to try to figure out what might come in the future? If you only knew what the United States government consults in trying to figure out what to do next, you would be shocked. In the deep research departments of the United States military, they consult all sorts of things. And they're looking for all sorts of things. One of the reasons that we have discovered when that we went into Iraq to begin with was to find the bones of Gilgamesh. Yes, he was a real person possibly Nimrod or his son. There are people who are seeking through ancient documents and deep archaeology to find some sort of advantage, as if they could bring back the ghosts of someone in the past to give them some advantage or wisdom. There are people who literally worship the devil and sacrifice people so that they can find some clue to what's going to happen next. There are people in our government who will not, they will not pray and listen to the Lord. But they'll do all sorts of other things to try to figure out what to do next. They are seeking, but they're looking in the wrong place. Nebuchadnezzar was seeking. But he, in his wisdom, he knew that all of these guys that he was asking the question of, they could not give him the answer. Which is why he had this test to begin with. Tell me my dream and tell me its interpretation. Because if he told him the dream, anybody could make something up. If you tell me your dream, and I don't really care what the interpretation of it is, I could probably tell you a good story about it. In fact, there are many people who consult crystal balls, and they cons consult astrology even today. They call 1-800 numbers or talk to people on the internet, and they're telling them anything that they want to hear, something that will make them feel better. But the answer that is given is not the truth. There are many folks who go to doctor after doctor after doctor trying to find answers for health conditions. And they'll find eventually a doctor who will give them the diagnosis that they want. And some of the diagnoses are true, but there are many who are trying to figure it out. Who do we trust? Who do we trust? Well, you can trust the Lord. Daniel was just a young man, 19, 20, 21 maybe. He wasn't very old. Who was he compared to a seasoned counselor of the king who had served many others in the past? Daniel was an unknown variable in Nebuchadnezzar's world. None of the Chaldeans or wise men or soothsayers knew who he was. He was a student learning their arts. He was learning their history. He was learning their things, but he had an advantage. He knew who God was. And he knew, because he knew who God was, that God alone reveals mysteries. Do you want to know something that you don't know? 
Well, the Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it to you. He won't make fun of you. That's what it says in the book of James. He won't upbraid you. He won't go, you lack wisdom. God knows we lack wisdom. Anytime we come before the Lord and ask for wisdom, He's not going to laugh at us and make fun of us because we don't know. He knows that we don't know. You know who doesn't know that we don't know? Us. We like to think that we know. But what we don't know can hurt us. God does know that we don't know. I'd be the first to tell you, there was a time in my life that I thought I knew a lot of things. But the older I get, the more I realize I know less. I don't know as much as I thought I did. I can spout off all sorts of facts for you. Probably could find any just about, just about any passage in the Bible if you quote part of it or whatever. I can help you with some things. But I lack a lot of wisdom. I actually did a spiritual gifts assessment test this morning. Finally found that. And one of the areas that I need to grow in is wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge are two very different things. But God is the author of wisdom. God is the author of knowledge. God is the one who created this world. He spoke it into existence. He wrote all of its history out before ever any day was. So it would make sense. If you want to know what's going to happen next, as you want to know what God wants you to do in your life, then you need to go to the source. You need to ask God. And then you need to wait and be patient. And do what He tells you to until He does that. Daniel knew that God alone reveals mystery. Who was in the beginning with God when He created everything? Nobody. Who told Adam about the creation? God did. Adam did not witness God creating light. Adam did not witness God separating the light from the darkness. Adam did not witness the, the, the sea and the land separating. Adam didn't witness any of that. The only thing Adam witnessed was the naming of the animals and the creation of Eve. God, he, he was asleep for that. So there is much that God can tell us that even the angels don't know because they are created beings. Proverbs 25, 2 tells us that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the honor of kings to search it out. God has, if you will, put Easter eggs all over His creation and it's our job to go figure it out. And there have been many people who have gone far and wide and their claim to fame is they crossed an ocean, they climbed a mountain, they walked across a continent, they discovered something that was previously undiscovered. That is the glory of men. The glory of God is to create all things and to hide His purposes and mysteries in them. The very first deception that we find in the Bible is Eve being deceived. Satan comes slithering along and says, God's withholding information from you. He knows that if you eat this fruit, you'll be just like Him. God is hiding things from you. Is God hiding things from us? God tells us what He wants, right? And He slowly reveals Himself to us through His Word. You will know more about God by reading His Word than you will about reading any other book. The one book that you should read is the Bible. Even if you don't read anything else, read the Bible. There's enough in there to keep you busy for a very long time. It's got drama, it's got tragedy, it's got prophecy, it's got, it's got good days, bad days, it's got everything in it. And you'll understand a little bit more about who God is by opening His Word. But the Lord has hidden things because we don't need to know everything. And at the right time, the Lord does reveal that. God has revealed much of it through His Word. There have always been false prophets with false promises. All throughout history, these people who have been misled by the evil one, soothsayers, magicians, Chaldeans, oracles, shamans, Egyptians had their priests, the Greeks had the illusion mysteries, there were the temples of, of Dionysus and all of these different things with Mithraism and Pythagoreanism and the Kabari and the Gnosticism and many people who were following Kabbalah today trying to figure out some hidden mystery in all of creation. Do you know who knows the truth about all those things? God does. So if somebody comes up to you and says, do you want to know the hidden things? If they don't know who God is, they don't know those hidden things. They could tell you a story. They're cleverly devised tales, and they probably will entice your hearing, and you might spend a lot of time running down those rabbit trails. But are they going to help you know who God is? No. No. 
There are many people who are, are being deceived and deceiving others by following things that are not true. God alone is the revealer of mysteries. Nebuchadnezzar had many around him who were saying that they could reveal those mysteries. The Chaldeans couldn't do it. The Magi couldn't do it. The soothsayers and wizards of the day could not do it. But Daniel could. And when God gave Daniel the interpretation, Daniel said, This mystery has not been revealed to me because I'm wiser than anybody else. It's because the God who created all things has revealed it to me to tell to you. He wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know that there is a God in heaven that Nebuchadnezzar could listen to and should listen to. That really is the foundation for everything. There's a lot of folks out there who are struggling today. They need to know that God knows exactly where they're at. And God can give them wisdom for their, for their situation. You and I may not be able to physically go up and help the people who are in the Carolinas and other places who are struggling with damage. But you know who can? God can. And God can give them exactly what they need in the difficult hour that they're in. Because you know how I know this? He's done it for us. And God knows everybody. God knows exactly where their needs are. And you'll hear, hear a lot of stories where it just so happened to be a coincidence that, you know, somebody was walking this way and they found somebody. You know who led that together? God did. God is the one who moves people's hearts to go and help. And God's the one who brings those things together. God does all of that. God is the one who reveals. And so, Daniel revealed the dream, which is an amazing fact. The Chaldeans could not understand what was going on in the mind of the king. King, we don't know what you dreamt last night. It could have been anything. And if we even attempt to make something up, it's probably going to be wrong. I can't tell you what you dream. I don't even want to know what you're thinking about. Right? I, that's not a power that's given to anybody. God knows what's in your mind. Even when you don't know what's in your mind. Because there are times when that happens. Even when you don't even know what your own thoughts are. God knows what your thoughts are. And God can help you make sense of that. So Daniel reveals the dream that God showed him. The king was sleeping. And in his dream, he saw a single great statue of extraordinary splendor. It was a beautiful thing. Awesome in its sight. And it had a gold head. There are six kingdoms listed in this statue. The gold head. A silver breast and arms, bronze belly and thighs, legs of iron, feet of toes and uh, feet and toes of iron and clay, and that's a, a significant. Five kingdoms in the statue, and then there was this huge rock cut out, not with human hands, and that's significant. Because what it tells us is that this comes not from man, but from God. The statue was in the form of a man. These are earthly kingdoms of men. But there is a kingdom coming, and already here, that has been cut out without human hands. And what it does to this statue that is of splendor and awe and extraordinarily beautiful, is it crushes it. It crushes it so that it dissipates like the dust and it's not even there anymore. Now that's significant. In fact, if you look at the amount of verses given to Dan Daniel's dream interpretation here, to what the dream was pertaining to the statue itself, it's less than the kingdom that's coming to destroy the statue. So I think when people preach this and teach this, they've got the focus all wrong. Is it important who the head of gold was? Yes, it is. It's important to note that these things have been fulfilled in history and are being fulfilled right now. But we need to focus in on the kingdom that is coming more than the kingdoms that are here. Because the kingdoms that are here are soon to be destroyed. So that was the kingdom. That was the dream that the king had. Very short dream, very short dream revealed. It's much like Joseph who was sitting in the prison and one night the king of, of Egypt had a dream. He had two dreams in that one night. Seven cows come up out of the Nile and they're, they're fat and they're full of, of life. And then seven other cows come up and they eat those cows. But those seven cows that were full are eaten up by seven cows that are skinny and lean and they're about to be dying. 
And then he had another dream about ears of corn that were full of, full of ears, full of corn. And then there were seven of them that were, were sun-beaten and, and they were sickly and they ate up those, dream, those seven that were full. And that would be enough for, for Pharaoh to be like, I don't know what's going on. It's troubling. You may have a dream in the middle of the night that you don't know how to answer. And instead of going in on the internet trying to figure out how to interpret your dream, what you may need to do is come to the Lord and say, God, I don't understand what I just dreamed. But you do. Will you help me understand it? And then just move on and let God take care of that. I do believe that the Lord speaks through dreams. I think you need to be really careful of that because I think that there are other things that can, that can influence your dreams as well. There are many people who are being led by dreams that are not from the Lord. They're being led by visions that are not from the Lord. All you have to do is open up, your, open up the internet. Go on YouTube, go on social media, look on TikTok. There's many people out there who are saying, God gave me a vision. Did God give them that vision? That's how, that's how cults start. Somebody has a vision from the Lord. And the next thing you know, hundreds of years later, there are millions of people who were deceived because somebody had a vision and it wasn't from the Lord. We have to understand what comes from the Lord. So, then Daniel says, look, that was a dream. I'm going to give you the interpretation now. The interpretation takes a little bit longer. He tells him, you, O king, are the king of kings. Now, I want you to understand something. One of Nebuchadnezzar's titles was King of Kings, which is a pretty audacious claim. But the reality of it is, is he truly was the king of the kings of the world. And if we hear what God says in here, God backs that up. So king, you are the king of kings. You're the head of gold. You are the one to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hands and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Did God limit that just to Neo-Babylonia in the Mesopotamia area? Everywhere that King Nebuchadnezzar went in his conquering, he conquered. God gave him that authority. God gave him that position. And there was none who would follow him who would be like King Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody wants to be the king of the world. There are many people who are clamoring for power and authority even now. Look around our world. I mean, we have all sorts of individuals and organizations trying to control things. Satan's trying to bring this world together. Not even the United Nations in all of its power and glory and splendor, however much that is, is even equal to King Nebuchadnezzar here. But none of them are equal to the kingdom that's coming. King Nebuchadnezzar had limited rule. There were not near as many people on the earth in those days as there is now. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel says, you're the king of kings. You're the king. You're the head of gold. God's given you this power. God's given you your position. God's given you your strength and glory. God has given him. He's caused you to rule over them all. Nebuchadnezzar needed to understand that God put him in that position for a reason. And the reason that God allowed Babylon to be a kingdom at this point was to judge the nation of Israel for their failure to follow God's laws. And for 70 years, Babylon would exist and then they would exist no more in that present state. Having heard that, Daniel then says to the king, there's another kingdom coming after you. It's inferior to yours. Because as we understand, gold is more precious than silver. Another kingdom is coming. The Medo-Persian kingdom would come. We'll see this in the book of Daniel. They would come, take over Babylon and everything else. But they were inferior. And then a third kingdom, a kingdom of bronze, which would rule over all the earth. And again, we'll see this in the book of Daniel. That's the kingdom of Greece, led by Alexander the Great. This is proven through history. Then there's a fourth kingdom. A fourth kingdom is coming that is as strong as iron, in so much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so that like iron, it breaks into pieces. It will break and crush all these into pieces. 
It's interesting, in my opinion, that the head had one central head. But the, the Silver Kingdom had two arms, and so it was the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medes and the Persians came together. And then there was a central body, the belly and thighs, that began to split. This was Alexander the Great, the Grecian Kingdom that conquered Persia. But then it splits into two, and we understand your Bible may actually have a heading that claims us to be Rome. I'm not going to deny that. Rome definitely fits the bill, but it's not the only kingdom that has crushed this world into pieces. I would encourage you, do a study on the nations that have come from the Roman Empire. It's a fascinating map. It literally covers the entire world. But there's also, on the other side, the, the, the kingdoms that have come from Islam. And Islam has crushed everything in its path. The nations of it that, have, that have embraced Islam have a huge coverage in this world. And so between Rome on the, e, on the west and Islam on the east, that has basically covered the world and it's still crushing the world today. So, I would, I would suggest that this fourth kingdom is Rome to begin with, and then Rome and Islam. And as you see, God understands. God knows this. God knows the, the interpretation, and, and I could be wrong about this. But there's coming a point in this that the feet and toes will be potter's clay and iron. And we understand that does not mix. I used to be a welder. Welded at the shipyard for many years. You have to weld like materials together. You cannot mix aluminum and steel. You can't weld those together. There may be some processes that you can kind of join them together, but the best way to join those together is bolting them together. You just got to bolt it together. But you certainly can't put pottery with iron. It just doesn't work out. You can set pottery on top of iron, you can set iron on top of pottery. But if you try to mix it together, the only strength in there is going to be the iron. The brittleness is going to be the pottery. And you know, I mean, if you, if you drop a, a ceramic glass or, or jar or a mug, it's going to shatter. You could drop iron all day long and it's not going to do much, it's just going to bounce around. The kingdom, I think that we're in the days of this right now. And it could be the United Nations. It could be some other thing. We're trying to have a global economy. We're trying to have a global world. In fact, the, the powers that be who are trying to, to enforce things and push things are trying to push people across national boundaries. There's a reason why people are coming to the United States. Non-governmental organizations, multinational corporations are picking people up from wherever they're at and they're bringing them here, forcing people to mix together. God loves people. God loves people of every nation. God loves people of every ethnicity, language, and He don't care what they look like. But we have to understand, it's hard for us to get together and, and agree if I don't understand your language. So I, I meet people all the time who speak Spanish. I, I wish that I would have paid attention more in high school when I learned Spanish. Because it really would be a blessing. But you know, they kind of hang out together. Because they understand one another. There's a reason why God des decided to separate the nations at the Tower of Babel. Because He knew if we all spoke one language and all got along together, we could accomplish a lot of things. But God has created those national boundaries and created the language boundaries so that we wouldn't destroy ourselves so quickly. But the world is trying to push us all together. It's trying to mix everybody up. There's brittleness in there. We won't cling to one another. There's distrust. There's problems between nation and nation. They will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. This is so important. If people would just read the Bible, it would give them an understanding of how they're doing things and why they shouldn't. But we know, people don't read it. And the nations are going to do what the nations are going to do because they don't care about who God is. In the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And when Jesus came and died on that cross and rose again, 
there are many people who have been entering the kingdom of God ever since. In fact, there were people entering the kingdom of God before Jesus ever came. There's only one gospel. The gospel was revealed to Adam after he sinned. I'm going to send a Savior who's going to save you from your sins. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. And Jesus has done that. He's doing that now. And the kingdom of God has been advancing ever since then. There are people who have put their trust in Christ from before Christ ever came. And we put our trust in Christ now, looking back to what he's done. And the kingdom of God is growing and growing and growing. It's growing. But there will come a day when the Lord Himself will come. We can read in the book of Revelation, there's even an asteroid that hits the world and it destroys all life in the sea. But Jesus comes and He crushes all of the kingdoms together and He puts an end to all kingdoms. Maybe you've heard this term, make America great again. Do you know who's opposed to this? God is. And even if America became great again, you know who's going to put an end to America? God will. I want this country to endure. I like living here. I'd rather live here than in, in an Islamic country. But we know it has problems. And the Lord will make everything right when He comes. When Jesus comes and crushes all of His enemies, they will cease to exist. And in the millennial reign of Christ, there'll be one king who rules over the whole world, and that will be Jesus. I'm not looking forward to, I mean, I'd love for the, for the nation of the of United States to become Christian. The only way that's going to happen is if you and me go out and share the gospel with our neighbors and with the people that we know. It's not going to happen because we elect a president who may or may not be a Christian. Okay? You're probably not going to elect a president who's a Christian. It's going to happen as you and I preach the gospel to people around us. But if we understand the words of Jesus, the world gets worse and worse and worse until He comes again. All around us we see dismay and perplexity among the nations for the things that are happening on the world. Who could have saw the events of last week with Hurricane Helene? Nobody could have. Nobody could have predicted that. And even if those people who were in the path could have been ready, they couldn't have been ready enough for that. If you had 10 seconds of warning, 30 seconds of warning, and you're swept away, nobody's prepared for that. The Lord said many things will occur before He comes, but He is coming and He will make this world right. These things happen because of sin within the world. And the world itself is groaning, waiting for the coming of the day of the Lord. Every time I see a hurricane or an earthquake or some other earth-shaking event, there was a solar flare the other day. It's supposed to hit the, hit the world sometime this weekend. I don't know what it'll do. But if, if the worst thing possible could happen and this world just starts doing all sorts of weird things, we have to understand the world itself, the physical world itself, is crying out for the day that Jesus comes back again. We're still suffering the ill effects of the world cataclysm that happened at the Great Flood. That's the reason we have weather problems. That's the reason why the earth shakes like it does. That's the reason for all of these things. I don't believe in climate change as, as pertaining to what the kingdoms of the world say it is today, but I do believe that the Lord changes the climate all the time because He's turning up the heat trying to get people's attention. And one day it'll be so bad that the sun will scorch men and people will curse God because of it. God's going to change this climate and then He's going to make it like the Garden of Eden once again. We're focused in on the, the statue. Daniel said, don't focus in on the statue. Focus in on the kingdom that's coming. Because the kingdom that's coming is going to crush that statue and remove it completely. There is no kingdom in this world that will ever, ever, ever be able to fight against Jesus. And they will. They'll attempt to. And when Jesus comes again, they'll all gather to fight against Him. And He will call for the birds, and they'll come and have a great feast. So Daniel said, look, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and it crushed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true 
on its interpretation trustworthy, 2,500 years have passed, or more, since this dream was had and interpreted. And one by one, each portion of this statue was fulfilled. The Medo-Persians came, the Greeks came, the Rome, Romans came, many other nations and, and empires have come and risen and fallen, and yet the kingdom of God still stands. All of those other kingdoms were inferior to Nebuchadnezzar. But there's coming a kingdom that will not be destroyed. There's coming a kingdom that will not be left for another. There's coming a kingdom that will crush and end all kingdoms and will endure forever. Jesus said that he must reign until all of his enemies are put under his feet and the last enemy is death. Adam's sin caused so much death. But when Jesus reigns, the last enemy that he will defeat is death itself. And will go on from this existence into eternity. So Nebuchadnezzar understood that God was the revealer of mysteries. He would understand later as Daniel continued to serve him in his court that all of these other individuals who were trying to reveal mysteries to him were lying. And he would eventually, through many trials and tribulations of his own, come to know who the real God was personally. But what he did here was significant. This king of kings, who had all of the power and glory and pomp and circumstance, he fell on his face and paid homage to God and to Daniel. He humbled himself. I think this is the appropriate appropriate approach. He was given a preview of world history yet to come. He would have a great kingdom, but there would be many other kingdoms that would come after him. And then there would be a kingdom that would crush all of them. Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and he paid homage to God. He said, your God is a God of gods. He is a Lord of kings and he is the revealer of mysteries. And I think that that was one of the reasons why God put Daniel in Babylon. Now, Daniel didn't want to be in Babylon. Daniel didn't have a, have a, a say in the matter. The Lord chose to put him there because he was living during the time of that exile because Israel had sinned. But God put Daniel in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar because God cared about Daniel and God cared about Nebuchadnezzar and God cared about the world. God is a God of gods. He is the Lord of kings. He is a revealer of mysteries. Remember, Daniel was inexperienced. He was, he was young. He, he wasn't even 30 yet. He was inexperienced, but he knew who God was. And so what happens here is Nebuchadnezzar promotes Daniel and he puts him over the whole province of Babylon and he makes him the chief prefect of all the wise men of Babylon. This is significant. Even if the people of the world do not know or love the Lord, God has people everywhere in all of the courts of all of the kings and presidents and other people who do know the Lord and the Lord is speaking through them to those individuals. Now it's up to them whether or not they'll listen. And it's up to us whether or not we'll listen. You may hope, you may vote, you may want this country to have another good four years in the future. You should want that. You should vote for the president that you think you would do that best. But here's what you need to understand. It doesn't matter who you vote for. You should, and it does matter to an extent. But if God wants to destroy this place, God will remove this nation from all existence. If God wants to bless this nation, God will bless this nation. God has the plan. I don't have the plan. We've got a preview of history to the future here. The Lord is coming. He's going to set up His own kingdom. We should be looking forward to that. We are citizens of that kingdom. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you're not of this world. And this statue means nothing to you other than to say, these are the kingdoms that are coming in this world. 
we should know that the Lord told us what was going to happen beforehand so that when it does, we'll believe Him. And this is what, why I believe this was written down. Nebuchadnezzar was right where God wanted him to be, at the right place, at the right time. Daniel was in the right place at the right time, and Daniel had wisdom given to him by God so that God could lead him and those who he was influencing. God rules in the affairs of men. Even if Satan holds so much sway over the governments of mankind, God is still sovereign. And though they will fight against him, God is simply arranging the chessboard so that he will come back at the proper time. We don't need to live in fear. You don't need to live in fear of what might happen next. You need to live in hope. Jesus knows what is going to occur. And so you and I can walk boldly out into the world that God has allowed us to be a part of. And in the times in which we live, and you and I can share the love of Jesus with everyone around us. You know who's helping those people up there in the Carolinas the most? It's not the government. God is. God's moving on friends and neighbors and other people. And He's bringing people from all over the place to rescue those people. God cares about those who suffer. God cares. And God knows exactly who needs help and how to help them. Nations may seek wisdom from all other sources than God. You and I need to seek wisdom from God. They may plot against God, but ultimately they're going to fall because God has told us how this ends. Let me end with this illustration. This is something that really did happen. During, during Nazi Germany, uh, one of the things that Hitler wanted to do was raise up a, four, a, th a third or fourth Reich, whatever it was. He was going to have a thousand year reign of Arianism. Where did he get that concept? Well, he got that concept from a misunderstanding of what the Bible says. The Bible never said that there would be a kingdom of mankind that would last for a thousand years and provide some sort of utopian per perfectionism on the world. But as that was beginning to come about, a German pastor was consulted about this. Do you think it will succeed? Somebody in the German army went to a leading German pastor who was following the Word of God, and he asked them, what do you think about this? This is his plans. Will it succeed? At least that military officer had the foresight to ask somebody who was listening to the Lord. And he said, no, it won't. And let me tell you why. And then he opened to this passage in the book of Daniel and explained to him from the book of Daniel that there was no way that Hitler would ever succeed. There are many people who have attempted it, and many people who are still trying it, and no person will ever succeed in being able to accomplish what only God will, and it will only be accomplished because God Himself does it. That should be our hope. And I want you to have more hope in Jesus than I want you to have hope in government or anything that in the kingdom of men could promise. God is who we need to cling to. God's told us His plan for history. Jesus is coming to fulfill it. My question for you this morning is, do you know who Jesus is? Have you met the King of Kings? God who sits on His throne is holy, righteous, and ju just. But we as man, though we were created in the image of God, all of us have sinned. Every single person in this world has sinned. All of us are in desperate need of a Savior. And the good thing is, is Jesus came at the right time into human history. And Jesus died on a cross. And He was buried. And He rose again the third day. So that you, you and I could pass from this life to the next one. That we don't have to just be among the, the kingdom of the sons of darkness. But we could know the true King of Kings. What will your response be? Will you put your faith in Christ this morning? We're going to have a moment of prayer. I want to be here at the front as we prepare for our, for our time of, of communion. But I want to encourage you. Do you know the Lord? And if you do know the Lord, is there any sin that you need to confess? Like I said, I'll be here at the front as we begin to pray. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. 
I want to thank you that your word is clear, Lord God. Only you will reign supremely over this entire world. I thank you, Lord God, for that. And I thank you, Lord God, that you've told us in your word what's going to happen before it does. And Lord, I pray that you would just move among your people this morning. Lord God, would you convict? Would you reveal? Lord, if there's any sin that is in our life, I pray that you would just show it so that we can just confess that. And Father, as we partake together of communion, Lord, this testimony of the coming kingdom that we're looking forward to, may you be honored in that. In Jesus' name.